I came to philosophy through an interest in politics. I was always interested, growing up as a kid, in political campaigns and elections and debates at election time. And I was a debater in high school. And so uh, when I entered college, I took a course in political philosophy. And I couldn't really make any sense of it. They gave us books by famous philosophers, Plato and Aristotle, but they seemed very abstract to me and distant and remote to the things I cared about. I couldn't really make se much sense of them. So I put philosophy aside for a time and studied what I thought were more concrete, practical things, politics, history, economics. And then in graduate school, I, I tried again. I began reading moral and political philosophy. And I became hooked by it, fascinated by it. But I always wanted to connect philosophy to the world, to show that the abstract ideas that the famous philosophers discuss are actually present just, beno just beneath the surface in the actual arguments and debates we have every day in our public life and also in our personal lives. I do think that as we go through life, we do encounter very often real paradoxes and dilemmas, ethical dilemmas, where there is no clear answer. It's true in, in when I teach political philosophy, I try to introduce students to the subject by beginning with hypothetical dilemmas, ethical dilemmas about trolley cars and, and about how many people you would save in an emergency. The reason for beginning with hypothetical, even fantastic, stories, it's a way of, of inviting students to think critically about their own philosophical assumptions. And then gradually, we deal with ethical dilemmas that are much closer to home. Questions about equality and inequality in our societies. Who deserves what and why? How should income and wealth and power and opportunities be distributed. Now these two are controversial questions that involve ethical dilemmas, but they are very real. And then, and then we get even to more personal questions, such as on what basis should students be admitted to university? Should it be on grades and test scores, or should ethnic and racial and geographical diversity also count? What about same-sex marriage? So we get to more personal questions as the semester goes on, because by then, students have acquired the habit of reasoning together and thinking together about some of these hard philosophical questions. completely neglect Aristotle's emphasis on honor and recognition, which comes up time and time again in political life and in political debates, uh, nor do I think we can neglect his idea that to reason about justice and rights requires that we reason and argue about the good life about what makes for a good human life, what makes for human flourishing. We tend to shrink from those debates today because we say in pluralist societies, people disagree about the best way to live, about what human flourishing consists in. So we try to keep those questions outside of politics. But I think this is a mistake, and that's why I see Aristotle as an important corrective to our tendency to set aside serious reflection and public deliberation about the meaning of the good life. In my book, What Money Can't Buy, I ask the following question. What should be the role of money in markets in our societies? Today, there are fewer and fewer things that money can't buy. In recent decades, market thinking and market values have begun to reach beyond the domain of material goods, cars, toasters, flat screen televisions. 
and begun to dominate other aspects of social life. Family life and personal life, health, education, civic life. This is what worries me. So I don't argue against markets. I argue against the tendency of market thinking to dominate social life in general. In a way, we've, we've drifted in recent decades toward having market economies and becoming market societies.